Uh, first of all, I'd say uh, it would be nice if we were invited, but the truth is um, we were late on application, so the only way to get here was to present, so <laughs> that's, uh, <laughs> that's why I'm here. Uh, what I would like is, can you just raise your hand if you use Diasend in your clinics? Okay, and keep your hand up if you, regardless whether the patient has a diary or not, you just use the Diasend download, you just kind of, you download them as soon as they come in and you don't really use their diary whether they have it or not. So most people. Okay, so keep that in mind. <laughs> After crunching the data, I probably would have changed the title from this to Diasend Project. Is it good? Is it evil? Um, and that will become quite clear as I kind of move through. As, as technology progresses, there are some great opportunities, but there are also some risks as well. So I'm going to talk about that as we move through. <laughs> but this is just a pretty much common dilemma that you'll see. For type 1 diabetes, a lot of information to track, a lot of information to cover. And if you're the parent or the child, there's a lot to keep. But as a healthcare professional, this is you when you get that phone call. You know, you've got to note all that information down and pass it around. So ideally, you know, you obviously get a bit of frustration. And what we'd like to do is teach our patients. We'd like to say, take a look at your download. What do you think is happening here? What adjustments could you make? But what ends up happening is increase your lantus by two units. See you later. Phone goes down. Because time is limited. And if you've got to collect all that information, it can be a bit of a challenge. So we'd... We would like to teach, but a lot of the time we end up telling. Do you think that's fair? Some nods, some no's. Depends. Possibly depends. So that was certainly our experience, is that we would very much be under time pressure and we'd end up telling instead of teaching. So we want to try and change that culture a little bit to more of a teaching rather than a telling culture, which is going to be a challenge because we need to teach the patients to want to learn. We needed to reteach ourselves how to teach and do that within a teamwork environment. And embracing some of the new technologies as well. We're not going to be able to do that probably by the diaries, and that's where Diasend comes in. But we've got a team of eight or nine nurses, three dietitians, five or six doctors, and a lot of other people. So we really needed kind of a dummy's guide too, so that everyone was following a similar process rather than pe <clears throat> people just doing their own thing, which can happen. Some people prefer mm -hmm. basal adjustments, some people prefer bolus adjustments and everyone's slightly different. Does that ring true with your teams? A few nods? Okay. So obviously Dyson offers a massive opportunity because people can download from home, you can download in clinic, and ultimately you should be singing from the same hymn sheet. You're looking at the same information that the patient is, and therefore you're kind of speaking the same language. But that only works if they can see that language at home. Um, which a lot of the times, if you're just downloading them in clinic, and then when they go home they don't have access to that language, all of a sudden you're speaking two very different languages that they don't have the opportunity to make adjustments in between clinics. And I'll come back to that when I show you our data afterwards, because that's got some pretty big implications. Because it's easy for us, isn't it, to download the meter, and it's there instantly, it's got a nice little colour-coded system, it makes things really easy to see, so we love it. But our patients don't necessarily always have access to that at home, so they don't have that same quality of information. So we wanted to change that around a little bit, and we had a few things that we need to have a look at. So there were some things that was going to promote this change for us, and um, the fact that you needed to collect data and collect contacts via the BPT. We had the main portion of the team was quite keen to get more people downloading at home and putting in place the system. And obviously we have Diasend, which... As Mark said, you can transpose Libra, pump downloads, and get the majority of stuff on there. There is stuff like Medtronic that you can't put on there, but the vast majority is. But you've also got some barriers. You've got the old guard, you've got the technophobes, and you've also got a financial challenge as well. So we wanted to get the Diasen put on three or four different computers so we could upload it in several places. So that was kind of, you know, looking around £20,000, which is probably not easily accessible to everybody. But we fortunately have um, a nice charities team that we wrote a bid to helped us with this money. So that was one thing that was a, a benefit from that. I'm not going to bore you with our Gantt chart, but in the terms of quality improvement, this is the sort of thing that you'll be doing. So we sat down and said, right, from this time in August 2016 through to where we want to be getting it running, what do we need to do? So we needed to get an agreement. We needed to get some charity bids. We needed to draw up some standard operating procedures on how to look through a download. We needed to get the patients in. We needed to go to their houses to actually set their accounts up if they couldn't do it themselves. This was a good lesson for us in if you're going to set off on um, a journey to make a change, you really need to sit down and plan it out properly at the beginning rather than just expecting it to happen. And that might be something as we move forward with the 
the quality improvement program that will, will bear its head potentially. But obviously you'll see on there, there's a celebration and a night out. You have to get a bit of an incentive for your team. So um, we made sure that there was something there, carrot dangling. And we did things such as, we were trying to get as many people downloading at home as possible. So we put little incentives in. So the healthcare professional that got the most accounts set up that month would get um, you know, a five pound voucher for this and things like that. But just small incentives drive change much more effectively than just do it because people have a lot of stuff to do as it is they, they're not like little incentives so just something to think about that worked really well for us and obviously audit the data as well so we thought at the beginning if we get loads of people da downloading the dice end and assessing their downloads it will improve our hba and c everything will be brilliant and i'll be stood up here going it's amazing everyone should be doing this but if you don't audit your data and have a look, does that actually work, you can kid yourself into thinking that it's good because it's new. So that's what I'm going to show you a little bit about the data now. I'm not going to go through the materials that we produced, but I, can, I will do if we've got time at the end. But essentially, rather than getting the patients to come in all the time, we worked with our IT department and developed some online tutorials that your patients could access if they so want, of how to set up an account, how to look through a download, um, how to consider making changes in terms of 10 and 20 percent so that they didn't have to keep phoning us to access that information they could just follow this process on here and what we did do is try to coin a bit of marketing and called our approach the vip which is just simply for first of all assess your values how many blood glucose readings are you doing what's your average blood glucose how many hypos have you had get them to think about where they're currently at Think about their insulin doses, what's their current ratios, what's their percentage of basal insulin, and then thinking about making a plan. So do we make a 10 or 20% change? Then how do I adjust it from there? So if I get time at the end, I'll show you how that works. But if you want to have a look at that, it's on our website where you can download and have it. If you want to give it a trial, I can email it you. You're more than welcome to have a bit of a look. So that's how we set it up. We're trying to get as many people downloading as possible. We're trying to get them to use this framework to assess their own control. And we kind of really push toward using Diasend as our sole platform for helping people improve their control. So it sounded like it was going to work really well. And <laughs> it did in some respects in the fact of any progress. So starting on the far left hand side, is what the download stats look like before we started. So the blue bar is downloads in clinic, which is just over about 500. That stayed pretty constant, but did drop a little bit as time went on. But you can see in the red bar is the downloads at home skyrocketed. And by the end, we're almost at 1,000 downloads every three months-ish. Number of people downloading, we've almost up to 200 now. And we've got a caseload of about 260 type ones about 40 or 50 type 2s, and then a few rares thrown in there for good measure. And then the really interesting one is the people who download in more than once in a three-month period, which is the purple bar, because that will become evident in a minute as to the difference between how many accounts have you got and how many people are actually using it. So it was a success in that we got a lot of people on. Someone's phoning me. Thank you very much for that. Um, it was a success in the fact that we've got a lot of people downloading at home and we've got a lot of downloads coming in. Although if you ask the nurses, I'm not quite sure they say that so much. We're getting all these emails, people phoning up with the downloads. So what did the results say? So if you look at all our patients just this year, since we've put it in place 2017, the overall average HB1C 68, the people who have an account at home, 63, the people who don't have an account, 73. So this is where I'd walk off and say, yeah, we did a great job. But you're probably looking at and saying, well, obviously, the people with a diet send account are the ones who are a better socioeconomic status. They're the people with computers, English as first language, and you'd be absolutely right. So you can't really use that as the marker because you've got, it's basically just a proxy measure for saying middle white class people who control diabetes well as a general overview is kind of what you'd be looking at. What is the difference? So we need to have a look at what was the difference between 2016 and 2017 for the people who had an account and didn't have an account? That's going to give you a better look as to whether it worked. So we did that. So 2016 to 2017 is your first set of columns on the far left. You can see that actually it hasn't really changed the average HbA1c over the year. But if you look at the people who didn't have an account in 2016 and did in 2017, there's a slight drop in HbA1c. But 
we've made the people who didn't have an account in 2016 and didn't have an account in 2017, we've made them worse by a bigger margin almost. So then that comes up to some questions is, why did we make those people worse? And also, that slight drop in HbA1c for the people who did have an account includes our newly diagnosed, who you would expect to have a lower HbA1c in the first place. So it's a bit of a straw man's measure to say that that's improved. So the best one to do is to take the people who didn't have an account in 2016 and did in 2017, take out the newly diagnosed, and then see what happens. So if you take those people, which was 103, didn't have an account in 2016, and then did in 2017, they didn't actually change in HbA1c, which is your far left-hand column. But then when you break that down to the people who use it frequently and don't use it frequently, there's a big difference. So the people who upload once or less every three months got significantly worse in terms of their HbA1c, but the people who downloaded at least twice every three months, probably more, i.e. used it regularly, got a significant improvement. So it's just like any technology, whether it's CGM, if you use it and use it properly, it's brilliant. If you, just because you've got a CGM or you've got an account, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make you better and may make you worse. So that left us some questions to ask for our service. But what we did do, and something that leans towards is this the right approach moving forward, is we took a look at our 2016 newly diagnosed patients and our newly diagnosed in 2017, and we took their last two HbA1Cs and took their first one away, which was obviously going to be high because they were newly diagnosed, and took the next two and see was there an improvement to 2016, 2017? And it looks like there potentially is. So introducing the downloading early, making sure that they download regularly is looking like it's going to be a benefit because the expectation has been put in there that that's how you do it. Whereas our older cohort, maybe we're struggling to impart that expectation on them. Does that make sense? So the big questions for us, and this might be a big question for some of you in your service, but you just don't know it yet because you haven't spent the time like I did, which I didn't like doing, several hours crunching numbers and putting, um, you know, doing these little stats. But our big question is, are we focusing too much on Diasend? So we need to speak the same language as the patients. So if they've got a Diasend account and they upload regularly and that's what they see at home, then we're talking the same language. We can actually make adjustments. We can teach them to make adjustments. But if they either don't have an account or they have an account but they just don't upload, then do we go back and say, it's your choice. If you want to download to Diasend frequently, you don't need to keep a diary, we'll speak your language. But if you don't want to do that, you're going to have to keep a diary. And when you come to clinic, we won't upload your meter because when you go home, you've got no way of how to assess things moving forward. You're just relying on coming to us once every three months to make changes to your diabetes. And then the question is, who's in control of this? Is it your healthcare team or is it the patient who's in control of their diabetes? So these are kind of questions we're asking ourselves now is, how do we make that happen in real life? And have we got the stoic nature for when people come up and without a diary and say, download with me to tell me what I need to do, we'll go, well, you haven't got a diary, we can't really help you. <laughs> but I would hazard a guess to say that a lot of our patients would either very quickly start uploading to Diasen and start taking some control or start keeping a diary because ultimately they want their diabetes to be relatively well controlled. So there's some potentials. So we do have 50 or 60 people who have an account but don't, don't download it frequently. And if you had diabetes and you went to your clinic and they said, you have a choice, you can note down every blood sugar, every insulin dose, everything that you do for the next three months, or you can upload once a week. What would you choose? Upload, probably upload, yeah. It's, it's a, fairly, be a fairly easy decision for me anyway, but there has to be an expectation that that happens. And if it doesn't happen, then we need to get them to use the diary so that they can start assessing their control at home. And obviously, We've started it with the newly diagnosed and that the expectation is you upload every two weeks and you upload frequently before you come to clinic. We're getting that message in, but that's going to take 10 years to get that benefit seen through. We need to do something for those people who are not uploading frequently. Okay, that's a bit of time. Um, and the other option is, for those people who can't access the downloads, is there something we can do for them? Do we demand that they keep a diary or do we do computer bids through 
certain charities? Do we look at an upload station in the hospital where they can nip in and download and assess their control? Pretty much everybody, even if they haven't got a computer, has one of these, where you've got an app where they can download a the station and view their results via here. So there are options, but we just need to be a little bit more smart about the way that we're going to approach it. And then there are other download softwares as well. We've tended to go very heavily with Diasend because it uploads the vast majority of them. When you've got such a wide ranging team such as we have to use four or five different download softwares and teach people that is really challenging. So we want to try and use one that people are very comfortable with and that the patients are comfortable with as well. But there are other good options as well. So in terms of our trust, when we feed information back, we're always asked about what's been the improvement in patient experience. So the patients will tell you they prefer it because they no longer have to keep a written record. Obviously that's good for the people who then engage in their download, but don't, it's not so good if they don't engage with their download. So we have improved the patient experience in terms of ease of life, but have we been clinically <coughs> effective? We have been for the people who download frequently, but we've been very ineffective for the people who don't because their expectation is we now take control of their diabetes once every three months rather than them keeping control either via a log every day or a download every week. So we need to work quite hard on how we're going to approach that in our, in our clinic. It is, in well, as long as they're not manipulating and using cans of Coke to test their blood glucose levels, at least it's fairly objective data. I'm sure you've seen plenty of written down blood glucose diaries that were filled out just before with 5.2, 5.2, 5.2. It takes away a certain element of that in terms of objectivity, and it does allow proactive and easy communication, but only if we really kind of push, push that that's the expectation. So, we actually won an award for this, which is kind of strange looking back, but in terms of using innovation and technology about making something happen, we certainly increased the uptake of it, but it has come, it's been a very useful project to identify what works and what doesn't work. It just, it, it's now given us a bit of insight moving forward to the next stage really of our development with it. We're more than happy for you to use our VIP process, have a look at our booklets for your patients who are using Diasend because they definitely work, but just be very careful that if you're going to really push a download technology that you also create an expectation that it's done weekly, two weekly, or frequently enough that they engage with their diabetes at home rather than let you be the person who looks after it for them. It's done. So if, if anyone has any questions, we actually have time for them. Um, one of the risks of technology, especially now that we're going on to the expert meter, is that the patients believe that all the information is held in the machine, so it's your responsibility once a, every three months to look at it, and so they have no responsibility. But equally, when it comes to looking at diaries, most of my patients, I insist they use diaries for whatever reason. I still like to download because sometimes you see things on the download a bit more clearly than you do on paper diary. But one patient then turned on to me and she diacendized her diary. What she did was every week when she wrote down the blood sugars, the ones that were red, red, the lows in purple and the others in green. And then you then don't need a download. You just look at her diary and that Your tells you exactly what it does. Than ours. Yeah. And so but now yeah. I've introduced that to patients who yeah. just use diaries and say, yeah. if you're going to spend the time to write it, interpret it, just color them in red, green and blue. And then you know your diary just like I do. So that's changed practice for yeah. some patients. Yeah, definitely. I think you just need to speak in the same language that they can access at home. And I think as healthcare professionals, certainly our doctors and our dietitians and nurses love the fact that we can download to Diasem. It's really pretty and easy for us to see, but I think we sometimes overlook the fact that that takes away that they can't see that at home. And I think that's something that doing this data has certainly picked out to us that we, I don't know whether we knew that, but the data kind of slaps you in the face and say, that is happening, you need to do something about it. Can I ask, John, I've tried to introduce weekly downloads to our patients, really, and it hasn't, well, the patients are a barrier to that because some choose to and some don't. 
The biggest issue we've had is actually allocating the staff to receive the downloads, interpret and give the patient support. And I'm just really interested in a large clinic how you've managed to um, arrange the staffing so someone's available for timely feedback to the families. Yeah, let me, what we tried to do, because we thought that at the beginning is... Oh, <laughs> Must be time. Um, is we knew that if we got loads of people just to download, then obviously we would just get loads of downloads saying, downloaded, what should we do? We tried to put together a little assessment process which would be simple, simple enough for them to start to think about making adjustments. How do you make this smaller? There we go. Um, so our framework was, this just talked through how to set up a Dyson account but really tried to keep it as simple as possible to one sheet, which was, you can see that on that front sheet, that color-coded sheet of Dyson, how many finger pricks are you doing a day? What's your period average? How many hypos? Can you see obvious patterns? What's your total daily dose? How to work out what your background percentage is and your, your ratios, and then make 10 to 20% changes. And then each section after that just had some simple things, which are not coming up, which is really useful. Um, had some simple things such as color-coded charts for HbA1c, for example, how to convert your average blood glucose to HbA1c to try and give them really the simplest tools that they could, if capable, um, do it. So we found that probably of the people who downloaded regularly, half of them were capable of asking those questions, the other half weren't, but at least that was half taken away from, from theirs, trying to give them a simple, simple enough process to follow that they felt confident in making changes themselves rather than just, I've uploaded, tell me what I need to do. Um, any other questions? Can I, can, can I hear? I've, oh, sorry. There's yeah, thank, thank you. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, I've listened to you before. Your talks are always stimulating. Uh, can I tell you about my own experience? I don't think professionals or technology uh, be it PAM, be it Libra, or anything, can take too much credit for improving control of HbA1c or anything else. I think if my own estimate will be probably about 20% professionals and technology and 80% patients' commitment, you see. At the end of the day, I think we should concentrate, or if we can concentrate, on how we can get patients committed, not only to download, Obviously, much of the data that you obtained are from patients who are committed to download. So basically, by definition, they are committed to improving their HbA1c better. So that's where we probably need to concentrate on how much or how can we get them to be committed to actually work with us so their contribution of 80% can top up our contribution of 15 or 20%. <coughs> Yeah, it's a good point. I mean, it's a million dollar question, isn't it? How do you motivate the unmotivated? I've got type 1 diabetes myself. I would put myself in the motivated crew. But I guess you've got a mixture of options, haven't you? You've got incentives that you can put in place and disincentives that you can put in place. The disincentive to me would be if I was told download or write every single finger prick down, I would definitely be taking the download. So it's not a either or. You're trying to engage them into doing something positive by offering them options. Um, the other one is, you know, kind of your H when people have got high HbA1Cs, have you got more regular contact that they have to come in and see you for? Yeah, that's kind of a disincentive, isn't it? If you've got to come back to Birmingham, Birmingham City Centre every two weeks because your HbA1C is high, it's enough to put anyone off. Um, but yeah, I think it's for those people, you've got to try and do a mix of incentives and disincentives and think what, what works and try things. And if they don't work, then, you know, try something different. But yeah, if it's... It's a self-management condition, isn't it? I think as paediatrics, it's very easy to keep hold of people and we'll, t we'll do it for you, don't worry, we'll sort it out. And then they get to 17, 18, they go to adults and then it's, it's all your responsibility. You know, it's kind of, um, it's, all, it's on you to do. So we need to make sure that we're empowering them. And that's one thing this project's taught me is to make sure we're speaking the same language, whether it's diasend or diary. It's got to be what they can see at home. Okay, and I think there's one more question. This lady at the front. I wonder when you give the um, children a diary, um, rather than the blood glucose meter and the downloads, do they actually write down how much insulin they use? I, I can imagine they will write down the blood glucose, but do they really write down how much insulin they use? Some do. Probably, well, I don't know, 
five ten percent of patients if they kept a diary would keep everything is that probably a fair estimation depends on where you are so obviously it'd be minimum i I think one thing about keeping a physical diary is when you write the number down, you write down the number 14 or the parent writes down the number 14, they go automatically, what happened before that? And it triggers a question that then triggers a solution. Whereas if you don't write it down or you don't at least look at it every week, those questions never get asked. So that Tuesday afternoon, how's it gone from 5 to 14 when the day before it was kind of 5 to 5? And then the question then sparks, oh yeah, I had that sneaky bar of chocolate in between. And then, well, how can we put in a solution? Do you either give insulin or you don't have it? Whereas if that conversation's never had because the information's never reviewed, and especially how many weeks do you look at when you go in clinic, the last two weeks? What about the other 10? <laughs> so, you know, they might do, how many of your kids do a fantastic two weeks before they turn up to clinic and then a terrible next 10? So there is that to consider as well, is, you know, people perform for what they're coming to. I know when I go to see the doctor for my, um, probably about the month leading up, I'm a bit more on target uh, with what I'm doing. Um, so, yeah, it's just, just something to think about. Great. Thank you very much, John. That's really interesting.